Well, hey, friend, welcome to Job with Julie, hosted by me, Julie Slattery. This podcast is listener supported, and it's an outreach of Authentic Intimacy, which is a ministry that helps people navigate God and sexuality. Well, today we're going to talk about shame. So when you think about shame, what comes to your mind? If you're like me, you might think about a few moments in your life when you did something or experienced something and you felt shame in the aftermath. The reality is shame is everywhere. Every single one of us experiences it. And as you're gonna learn from my guest today, it's something that we all began to experience at a really young age, actually before we were two years old. My conversation today is with Dr. Kurt Thompson. Kurt is a psychiatrist and a well-known author of the book, The Soul of Shame. His faith allows him to bring a really unique perspective of God and humanity to those to whom he ministers. Now we're going to talk today about why acknowledging shame is so important and how vulnerability can be such a useful weapon in helping us move past it. So settle back and enjoy this conversation with Dr. Kurt Thompson. Well, Dr. Kurt Thompson, thank you so much for being back with me. And as we were getting ready for this conversation, you just made a statement. You said, I love shame. (laughs) So tell me what you mean by that. (laughs) Well, Julie, first of all, I was going to say I'm really happy to be here. And now I'm just (laughs) going to think about that for a second. Oh, no, I think um, I think what I mean by that is that uh, shame is so ubiquitous. It's so much a part of everything that is challenging about life. And there are very few places that we would turn that don't have something to do with it if we're really talking about things that are challenging in life. And so when I say I love it, I mean, in some respects, it simplifies life. It lets us know that that is something that we can always be curious about. Where is shame wanting to come into the room? Mm -hmm. And in that way of simplifying our curiosity, it gives us an opportunity to do the practice work that we have to do to both be aware of where shame is, uh, take note of how it's manifesting in terms of what we sense and image and feel and think and the stories that we tell, and then also come to terms with what the very simple but necessarily repetitive practices are that we have to do to respond to it. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to getting into those repetitive practices because I think that's where people are like, all right, I want that help. We will get there. But before we get there, what is shame? How is it different from our experience of guilt or being embarrassed? How would you define it? Yeah. Well, I think as this is a common question, it's it's a good question. And I think one of the first things that I reflect to folks is that I I don't so much define it as we as much as we describe it. And we describe what our experience is. And the first thing I think there, there are some features of it that I think that are I mean, in some respects, uh, to all of our listeners, we might say, look, nobody needs to define it. Like, we all we all get it. We all know. Nobody, you don't need a, a shrink to tell you, like, when you're feeling ashamed. We all kind of know when that's, when that's happening. At the same time, I think it's actually also very common for us to be quite unaware of when and how shame is actually being activated in our life experience. And so I think having some sense of awareness of how it manifests itself can be useful. So the first thing that we say is that shame, first and foremost, is a neurophysiological event. It's a thing that I don't just, it's not just an abstraction that I think about. It is a thing that I sense Mm. in my body. It manifests in a way that I sense it in my face, in my chest, in my hands. Different people have this different sense of that. And there is a certain sense, neurophysiologically, a certain sense in which my reaction is one of diminishment. I want to turn away from people. I want to turn away from myself. I would love to turn away from the things that I'm thinking that represent the things that I'm feeling, this thing that I'm sensing. So there is a turning away from life, a turning away from others, a turning away from myself. This all happens quite automatically, quite non-consciously. I don't have to think before I sense it. I sense it. And then I start to think about what is happening to me. So that's one thing that's important to know. It's a Very much, it's an embodied experience. Yeah. Can I, before before you go to the second thing, can I ask you if my brain were hooked up to all the different things that you study, like scans, could you tell when I feel shame just by looking at brain activity? It's a good question. There's no evidence that would indicate that there, for instance, is a place in the brain 
that is the like the shame locus. It's like, they, well, there's the place where shame, when these neurons turn on, that's, those are the shame neurons. There is, however, a much more of a kind of a matrix-like phenomenon because it involves so many different parts of our experience. In the same way that you don't necessarily have like a joy center or a sadness center. In some respects, when it gets to our awareness of explicit emotional states, we're really talking about, you know, conscious awareness of it. And that is something that we don't yet have under, where we don't understand yet where those, like consciousness, we don't know what consciousness is exactly, or it's, it's certainly not located in a particular place of the brain. It's kind of out beyond all of what we know about the brain. Mm -hmm. We know it exists because we're here talking to each other, but trying to get our hands around it exactly is pretty tricky to do. But what's important to know about how it manifests itself in our bodies, what we sense, what we image, what we feel, what we think, and what I want to do with my body, those are the five, those, that sift B, what I sense, image, feel, think, and what I want to do with my body, my behavior, those five ways, it's kind of like a shorthand for knowing what the mind is doing. We can be curious about that anytime shame is in the room. There's some other important things to know about it. Number one, it begins to manifest itself as early as 15 to 18 months of age. Hmm. Long before we have language, long before we have cognitive understanding of what it is, we see infants, toddlers, young children begin to manifest this in a, any number of different ways, which also means we've been practicing this in our bodies for a long, long time. And we've been practicing it for a longer time than we've been aware that that's what we've been doing. So we're really good at it. It doesn't take much effort for us to automatically respond to a shame inducing event, whether it's coming to me from the outside of my skin or whether it's coming to me generated from within my own mind, some story that I'm telling about myself. Another thing about it is that it tends to be what we would call disintegrating. It's not easy for me to think clearly. It's not easy for me to be creative. It's not easy for me to be curious. It's not easy for me to be open and engaging and wanting to be with people when I'm in the middle of feeling like this. It tends to disconnect. If our listeners, if anybody, if you just thought about the last time you felt really strongly ashamed, or maybe even a little bit, how easy was it to think? How easy was it to ask questions? How easy was it to behave? How much connection do you want to have with other people? Do you want to tell people that this is what you're feeling? Mm -hmm. No, it tends to disintegrate and then lead us toward hiding and isolation. And this starts just with our very physiology. One can watch a dog be ashamed and it lowers its head, puts its tail between its legs. It doesn't want to look at you. Mm -hmm. It avoids this contact with us. The other thing, though, that it does, and, and this is where, where things are, are really, we get close to, it's really important to recognize that most of us, if we talk about the topic of shame, it's always going to be related to something that we can remember about some kind of relational rupture, something that happened to me or involved me that was unpleasant that I can remember as a, in terms of an event. What we've been talking about so far is just our neurophysiologic response, what it tends to do. But at some point, we recognize that our embarrassment, our shame is contextualized within some kind of a story that we're telling. We're not just lizards. We're not just antelope. We are human beings and we are storytellers. And this is what's also crucially important is that anytime I have some kind of experience with shame, I am sensing it. We like to say that the brain first senses something and then we make sense of what we sense. Mm. In brain time, we are, we're doing this very, very quickly. But first I sense, and then I make sense of what I sense, and then I sense what I've made sense of, <laughs> and then I make sense of that, and on and on we go. And so I'm continually telling a story. And the story that I'm going to tell is one of which like, I'm going to make sense of this thing that, that I call shame that I'm feeling right now. What am I? Well, she must not want to be my friend anymore. My dad doesn't love me. I'm no good at this. I'm really, and the list goes on and on and on of the narratives that we begin to tell. And this is why I say like, if we then just pause and say, look, the biblical narrative is that it's a narrative. It is a story. As the folks at the Bible project like to say, it's a unified story that leads to Jesus. And we, we are also storytellers. And what evil wants to do is to utilize shame as a weapon to 
disintegrate our story. The Bible is the story of a God who has come in the person of Jesus to tell God's story and invite us to join in that and replace our story with his. Mm -hmm. This is not easy to do because of how long I've been practicing shame, how much we reinforce shame culturally and socially in our families, in our classrooms, in our training centers, in our churches. There are ways in which we're reinforcing it. It is important to note shame in and of itself as a neurophysiologic event in and of itself is not good or bad. This is really important. Uh, we recognize that shame is what appears that the first couple began to experience mm -hmm. in the Garden of Eden yeah. in Genesis chapter 3. But if they experienced it, it means it was a built-in mechanism that was part of the creative order. If this is what you do, this is what you're going to experience. Mm -hmm. But its purpose is as a signal. Its purpose is to say something's not okay here. What, what am I then supposed to do? The problem is not that we experience shame. The problem is what we do in response to it. Yeah. And the story of Adam and Eve is a story of what we all do in response to shame. We turn away. I turn away from the other. I turn away from myself. I certainly turn away from God. And then I make up all kinds of stories that help me make sense of my need to turn away. God's coming to kill me. So when God comes and asks, like, what is it that you've done? Where are you? I'm going to have to make something up instead of just telling him the truth, risking that he might actually put me to death because he said, you know, the day that I eat the fruit. And so this is what's also important to know. You know, there are actions that people commit for which shame is the appropriate response mm -hmm. because there are shameful actions that people commit in the world. Yeah. The question is, well, once I'm there, then what do I do? Mm -hmm. And this is where the gospel also speaks so powerfully in terms of the story that it tells as it relates to our own neurophysiology. If you look at the thing that we experience that we call shame, and you compare that to the thing that we experience that we call guilt, we have some rather remarkable uh, discoveries. Uh, first of all, the thing that we call shame, as I said earlier, begins very early in development. The thing that we call guilt that people experience, children experience, doesn't begin in a child's life until they're somewhere between the ages of about three and five years of age. Mm, wow. Because it requires the further development of the prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brain, our thinking brain, our planning brain, our reflecting brain, that also is aware that I can do something that is separate from who I am. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. But it also, the development of my prefrontal cortex, also lets me know that if I've done something, it might actually hurt your feelings. Mm -hmm. It requires me to know that there's another person in the world that might be affected by this. Shame, it's just all about me because I'm not thinking about it having to do with other people. It's all that I'm feeling only by myself. But one of the, when you look at children, college students, there have been other, these studies have been replicated where the first thing, if, if a person who's experiencing guilt because they've done something wrong to hurt someone with whom they have a connection, mm -hmm. they have a perceived connection, whether it's real or it's, you know, I hit, you know, I accidentally ran into somebody in the cafeteria, spilled their tea. I don't even know them, but I have a felt sense of I did something to hurt somebody else. One of the first things that we tend to want to do when guilt is the thing that we're experiencing, is to go toward that person to make things right. Yeah. With shame, I won't do that. Mm -hmm. When I feel shame, I will turn away from you, which is how it is that so often sin, the notion of sin and the notion of shame are so frequently paired in the biblical narrative. Right. So let me just say real quick. So you're saying that usually we experience shame and guilt together, but is there a conflict of... What am I going to do? I'm going to respond right. in healthy ways to guilt or unhealthy ways to shame. Well, and, and we can say, you know, and guilt in the in the biblical narrative, guilt is much more of a legal term. Mm -hmm. Like you've done something wrong. If you do this thing, then your guilt is washed away. You sacrifice an animal. You are forgiven. Your guilt is taken care of. But it all it would take would be a little thought experiment for our listeners to do. You might find your, you've done something. You've hurt your good friend's feelings. You go to your good friend and you say, gosh, I'm really sorry. Would you please forgive me? And they say, yes, and we're good. And most of the time that'll be fine. But the next day you'll wake up and you'll think about it and you might still feel that. 
Mm -hmm. And it would be easy for us to say, I still feel guilty. And we would say, no, what you're now talking about is shame. Mm -hmm. Because the guilt has been taken care of. Yeah, somebody has said that it's been taken care of. But my sense, this feeling that there's something wrong with me still. It's not just that I did a thing wrong. It's that there's a something about me that is not okay. Mm -hmm. Which is why in the biblical narrative, for our shame, we can't do enough to fix it. We're not going to turn toward God for that. God has to come for us. Mm. Because in my shame, I'm continually turning away from you. When it comes to sexual sin, like who wants to, like, you know, we'll talk about all kinds of things about, you know, we might even talk about my greed. We might even talk about my this or my that. But when it comes to the parts of me that feel really, really, really vulnerable. I'm not prone to want to turn toward you. And so I need you to come find me in Mm -hmm. the middle of all that until we've practiced doing this enough, where in which I then eventually am able to come to you and say, I'm feeling ashamed, but that isn't, that takes lots of practice Mm -hmm. for us to be able to do that. Yeah. I either even feel shame around saying I feel ashamed. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The very naming of it. So you brought up, you know, sexual struggles, this podcast, a lot of what we talk about is sort of the integration of faith and sexuality. Mm -hmm. It seems as if almost every aspect of our sexuality has shame attached to it. Even Mm -hmm. sex within marriage, which is supposed to be beautiful, there's all kinds of shame traps. The -hmm. amount of shame that people feel, for example, with masturbation, even though Mm -hmm. it's not even clearly addressed in scripture, Mm-hmm. You know, sexual abuse and trauma victims like can battle shame their whole lives. Why is it that sexuality in particular is such mm-hmm. an area of shame for many of us? Yeah, that's a great question, Julie. And I, I'll be the first to say, like, I don't know the answer to this question. Mm-hmm. I have some suspicions, though. I have some wonderings about this. And I think the first thing is I think that we have a somewhat anemic and or under- we, we are under aware of the depth and the power of the purpose of human beings being agents of creation. I think we are so far removed from our awareness of just how big a deal creation is mm-hmm. and that we have been asked to do this with God. I think we are also, it's hard for us to be aware of just how big a deal it is Interestingly enough, I'm certainly not the only one or the first one to just name this and recognize this. Why is it that the mechanics of our physicality that are required for creation are as they are Mm -hmm. in our physiology? Like, why can't creation just be like shaking hands? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, of course, there'd be people pregnant everywhere, like all over the place. Right. But why can't it be like bumping elbows? Why couldn't it be like it could be something as simple and as um, unself-conscious as that. How is it that the parts of us physically that are deeply tied to creation, to creating things, are also the parts of our bodies that are literally quite neurologically so vulnerable? Mm -hmm. And I think that because of that, And again, it's not like, well, I refuse to, you know, they tried to teach me this when I was six and 16 and I just refused. I'm just saying, like, I think historically, because of the degree of the depth of our brokenness as a human race, we are unaware of the degree to which there is significance with this. Mm -hmm. And so... Remember, I said shame is a signal that is trying to tell us, like, it's, it's asking for protection. Mm-hmm. It's asking to be guarded. And so it's like, you know, we put a lot of guardrails around nuclear power plants. Mm. You know, you can't just, like, walk in and do whatever you want to do in a nuclear power plant. And there are lots of guardrails placed around this in the same way that there's lots of security around the Hope Diamond. Mm-hmm. There's lots of security around Fort Knox. There's a lot. But it's so challenging for us when we don't yet have a sense of what our main purpose is in the world as agents of creating beauty and goodness, of creating outposts of Eden. And so what happens is that our sexuality becomes, it's an accessory. Mm. And we have these, I think, you know, even as people of faith, we have theologies and we have spoken in abstract guidelines about what's important, what's not important, and so forth and so on. But the degree to which we feel viscerally in our chests 
just how big a deal it is for me to be a male or for me to be a female, for what it means for the feminine presence in the world, the masculine presence in the world. Like we are so far removed from awareness of this that it just seems to not make immediate sense. Like, why am I so ashamed about these particular things? Yeah. It's because I think in many respects, we have not yet really come to terms with how deeply loved we are, how big a deal we are in the world, and therefore that we are walking around carrying these nuclear powered generators Mm -hmm. of new life. And that God is like excited for us to be able to do this. But we also equally don't recognize that it is evil's intent to devour the whole project. Yeah. And I'm even thinking as you're describing that, if you say one of the primary ramifications of shame is disintegration, like building up Mm -hmm. barriers, I'm wondering to the extent to which our shame around our bodies, our gender, our sexuality keeps us disintegrated, where we have a natural aversion to then considering the spirituality connected with our sexuality and the significance of it. So an evil has a, a right. part in that too. Right, right. Yeah. Well, and I think also, you know, we, we talk about the language that we use uh, is the language of uh, disintegration and compartmentalization. Mm-hmm. So we talk about our bodies, then we talk about my spiritual life, we talk mm-hmm. about my mental life, we talk about my physical life, we talk about, and it's not unreasonable to use those categories to talk about it, but they would not make really all that much sense to a first century Hebrew. Mm. Yeah. A first century Hebrew would say like, it's all, all of life. God is, I mean, everything is spiritual. Like there's nothing that we're doing that is not part of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. But we tend to abstract that the kingdom of God, we tend to abstract my spiritual life. And so hence it's hard for me to actually get, have a sense that I felt sense that my body is the temple of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. What we read about in one Corinthians 6, 19, Paul says this in more than one place in the New Testament letters. Do you not know that your body, and by this, not just your singular body, Kurt, but your body corporately, your body, it's both and, Mm -hmm. is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We read that, and we are, we have so disconnected what we call religion and our spiritual lives and so forth into this vast world of abstraction that it's hard for us to recognize that for a first century person, in Palestine, in Rome, in Corinth, one's religious experience was everywhere. Mm -hmm. Wow. Temples are everywhere. Yeah. And so for them to, for him to talk about that, there would have been a much more viscerally felt sense that when we read this, like, well, of of course, like Mm -hmm. now it's a big deal because Paul is elevating the body in ways that Romans and Greeks didn't. It was important to the Romans and Greeks, the body was, but for utilitarian purposes, what can I do with it? Mm-hmm. But for Paul, it's what can God, how can God occupy it? Mm. Which would have been weird for anybody. Like, what do you mean God occupying your body? Like the gods are like, and so this again, though, that God takes up residence within us is a thing that we kind of just kind of take for granted, but it doesn't, it has not yet easily landed within us in a viscerally felt sense. Yeah. Yeah. Friend, let me ask you, do you have questions that you've always wanted to ask? Well, now is your chance. If you have questions about biblical manhood and womanhood, maybe some parts of scripture that you struggle to reconcile with your sexuality, or anything else that has really popped up for you as you've been listening to these podcasts, now is the time to ask your questions. So starting today and for the next two weeks, we're going to have a place on our website where you can drop your questions about God and sexuality. We're going to put these together in a Q&A episode covering your most pressing questions, which should make for a pretty fun and insightful discussion. So if you'd like to submit questions for the show, just go to AuthenticIntimacy.com or you can click the link in the show notes. All right, back to my conversation with Dr. Kurt Thompson. Kurt, what are the consequences of living in a culture that at every turn wants to deny shame or just say, you know, banish any thoughts of shame, get rid of it instead of staring it in the face. Yeah. Well, I think the first thing that happens, uh, Julie, is that uh, shame is just automatically reinforced. It's reinforced. I think of the text in Hebrews 12, 
where we read that, therefore, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame or disregarding its shame. He looks shame square in the face and says, you're not going to be in charge of the outcome of this story. You don't get to be in charge of this. This from a man who was stripped naked Mm -hmm. to be crucified. Mm -hmm. And we have so much practice corporately not paying attention to our shame that in so doing, we then tend to only behave in ways that do reinforce it. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. I'm so ashamed of something. And so I'm going to bury that. That takes energy for me to keep the shame contained. That is energy that I then do not have available for me to live in a flourishing way with you and to be honest with you about what's hard for me, what's good for me, what's hard for you, what's good for you. I can't interact with that. And so I'm much less aware of how shame is manifesting. And the things that I'm not aware of are the things that I'm bound to repeat. Yeah. And so you're saying by like refusing to face it, we actually have more shame. And like, you think we have more shame in our culture today than we do in a culture that is saying, hey, let's acknowledge shame. And you should feel ashamed for this or that or the other thing. Right. Well, I think there, you know, there, there are probably a number of ways to talk about that. In, in some respects, is, as many other people have you know, already you know, named, in some respects, we live in a shameless mm-hmm. culture. Yeah. People do all kinds of things for which shame, sh- shame would be the reasonable response, mm-hmm. and it's not, because they had practiced not paying attention to shame. Mm-hmm. And we don't pay attention to shame because it's too overwhelming. And so the shameful acts that we commit are our acts in which we are trying to get someone to love us while at the same time we are actually terrified of love showing up on our doorstep. Say more about that. Like, what does that look like? Well, I mean, as we say, like your our pop music and everything else, like we, you want, one would think that we're really interested in love mm. and we want to be loved. We want to love others and we talk about it and sing about it and so forth. And we do until love actually shows up because when love shows up, uh, it turns out that love does come to care for us, but love cares for us in ways that we don't necessarily enjoy. Like it places demands on me. Mm -hmm. It says, Kurt, I would like to now go into the basement and look in the rooms in your house where you have things that you've not told anybody. Mm -hmm. It says, I would like for you to love your neighbor and pray for your enemy. And I don't really feel like doing that. Mm -hmm. It says, I would like you to become a peacemaker within your family instead of a warmonger. Mm -hmm. It says, I would like you to live by the Sermon on the Mount, which I can't do very well. It says, I would like you to be the bearer of the fruit of the spirit, which I don't do very well. It wants to change who I become. It doesn't want to come and play nice. All right. So what you said right there, I mean, you're kind of describing the love of Christ, but that is in conflict with, I think, what even a lot of Christians believe that God's love is, I love you as you are. You don't need to change. Well, I think we'd have to decide, like, well, what do we mean by I love you? What, what, what do we mean by that? Like, we love, it's kind of like, you know, so I, I had rotator cuff surgery about nine weeks ago. And so I've been in the middle of physical therapy now mm-hmm. for the last, like, seven weeks. And these are the most beautiful, brutal people you've ever met in your <laughs> life. If you've ever, if you've ever listeners have ever had physical therapy. And these two therapists that I'm working with, like, I just, I love these folks. Mm-hmm. I love them to death. And they would be ones who would say, y'all come. Y'all come into our physical therapy office. Y'all come. And I said, okay, great. We're all welcome. This is what God does. He's very hospitable. Y'all come. I have big table here. And we get there. And then they say, now, I'd love for you to just get on the table and let me do to your shoulder what I need to do. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, this was not my idea of a feast. Huh. But what they're doing is that they are helping me practice for heaven, right? This is what the church does. And so when we say God loves us as we are, it means God is hospitable to us. He's not asking us to change, to come be with him, but he knows that to be with him will require that we will change. Mm -hmm. It's going to require me to become more like Jesus. And to become more like Jesus means I don't get to do, I don't get to be the one who is in charge of deciding what's right and wrong in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't get to decide that. This is a big part of repentance. The, The primary part of repentance is about what, you know, Adam and Eve, they made the decision. It was a test, right? And in the test, they decided they were going to decide what was right and wrong. Mm -hmm. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, I'm going to decide. 
I'm going to decide this. And this is what most of our acts of what we call sin, sin being the turning away from you, the turning away from God, the turning away every, you know, if I bark at my wife, I'm not coming toward her. I'm turning away from her. Mm -hmm. If I harbor a grudge about someone, I'm not moving toward them by praying for them. I'm turning away from them. And that, so therefore I turn away from one of God's image bearers, which means I'm turning away from God. Mm-hmm. You can't escape it. If I'm turning away from a person, I'm turning away from God. There's a point I'm turning away. And God is saying, if you want to be with me, I like, I want you to be with me, but to be with me, this is like the whole book of Leviticus, right? Is about God having his people practice doing all the things they need to do, all these ritual. It's helping them practice to come near to him. They have to get ready to come near because they're so unable to do it. They're complainers. They're whiners. They're like, take us back to Egypt. They are weak. They are unresilient. Mm-hmm. They are milk toast. Yeah. And he's trying to get them ready for heaven. As I listened to Dallas Willard say in a lecture he gave once, he said, God will let anyone into his heaven who can take it. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Let's make this practical for like just the the average individual who's wrestling through, for example, a struggle with pornography or a struggle with, I think I'm gay. And there's one level where it's like, they're trying to receive this message of grace that God loves me for who I am. He's not judging me, Mm -hmm. but how does that apply? Like, how do you deal with that shame in such a way that you're not turning your face away from God, but you're turning your face towards him. And what does that acceptance and love look like in a struggle like that? Yeah, well, I will, um, I'll just refer, you know, the last time we talked, we talked a little bit about confessional communities. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just take a quick, to refer back to that. And then also, you know, we'll just kind of borrow a page from the recovery movement from AA and NA and such. And when we have an experience of being seen, soothed, safe, secure in the context of a community. When someone shares their story in one of these confessional communities, and it's a story of shame, they're going to have perhaps a moment in which they look up and they see that others are not condemning them. Mm -hmm. And their experience of being received, their experience of hospitality, their experience of being loved in that moment is not an abstract idea. It is an embodied encounter that happens right there. And we would say that they're having that encounter in the absence of them looking at porn, in the absence of them smoking their weed or doing their pot or drinking their alcohol or whatever it is that they're doing, in the absence of their addiction, in the absence of their their addiction to shame. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an embodied experience. And as we like to say, all theology is preceded by experience. Theology is something we write about. We're writing about the experience that we've had. Mm. And then when we read it and we study it, it reinforces the experience that we had. But you cannot shoehorn theology into someone who has not had the experience of what the theology is talking about. Which I think is what often happens in these situations is we give somebody theology, but they've never experienced as you would describe the hospitality of being received and loved through it. Right. And so we have a moment of being received, and that is a felt thing. And one of the things that we will then do in that moment in one of these confessional communities is that we will pause the process and we will say, Brenda, let's just pause. And I want you to go around the room and take a look at everybody Mm -hmm. who's just offered these reflections to you. I want you to pay attention to what you're feeling. and And as you take a look at everybody who said what they've had to say, I want you to look them in the eye and I want you to name what it is that it's been like for you to have this experience here in the last few minutes. And Brenda will do that. And then we will say, Brenda, what I want you to do is to go home. And tonight I want you to uh, it, literally, like literally, it's got to be within the next 24 to 36 hours. I want you to write the screenplay of what has just happened here in the room. Huh. Because I want you to reinforce in your embodied felt experience of what it was like for you to be loved. Now, it is important to remember then that that moment, if we don't kind of build an Ebenezer, if we don't give her an assignment to begin to do this work, that moment will then, she'll leave and it will now be in competition Mm -hmm. with all the other moments 
with the pornography, with the temptation to alcohol, with, with whatever it is. This is why for some people, when they are early in the process of, you know, recovery, they're either maybe going, you know, they're going to an inpatient unit or they're going to a place where they can be like all the time. They're with people who are doing this kind of work because it takes that kind of intensive opportunity for the brain to be apart from the activities that are reinforcing the addiction mm-hmm. yep, and the shame that accompanies it. Mm-hmm. And so concretely, we would want Brenda to know that she does this. And then every day for the next seven days, I want you to rewrite this screenplay. I want you to pause and remember what it was like for you to be here in the room. I want you in your mind to see where each person was. I want you to replay what they said. I want you to write out what you sense in your body, how and where. I want you to come to terms with what does it feel like to be loved like this? Mm -hmm. What are you sensing? And now I want you to begin to picture, what is it like for you to now start to imagine Jesus being in the room? Mm -hmm. Now, what we're doing here is that we're giving, we're not giving Brenda information in terms of like we're telling her something we're not teaching her theology her theology is being built into her body yeah and julie this is a thing that has to be practiced over and over and over and over again while at the same time that same person is willing to practice restraint and refrain from the addicting behavior now the addicting behavior is not just looking at pornography it's not just masturbation It is even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is, of course, that it's more difficult for me to stop my thinking process than it is for me to choose not to go look at porn. Right. And so we would say, right. And this is going to take a long time to do. And we're not worried about that. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about how long this is going to take. Jesus is not worried about how long this is going to take for us. Yeah. He's not worried about this. You said something at the very beginning of our conversation that there are things the church does to actually reinforce shame instead of pointing them to these kinds of practices that free us from shame. How is that? Where do you see that happening? I'm going to answer that question by saying something else first, and that is I think it's important for us to remember all systems in the world are modeled after the family. Mm. There's not a single system. The U.S. Postal Service. Really? Wow. IBM. Harvard. How? I mean, Little League baseball it, yeah, team. I mean, how does it happen? Because every system has somebody who's at the apex of leadership. Mm-hmm. Families have moms and dads, mm-hmm. right? We have a leadership head. Yeah. And by that, I don't just mean, I'm not talking about like a man or a woman. I'm, I'm talking about like in two parent homes, you have a leadership head. You have a headwaters, right? You have this. Yep. And then who else is there? You have children. Mm-hmm. Now, a range of different kinds of systems, right? You have families with one child, families with no children. You have families with six, seven, ten kids. But if you have more than one kid, you have a firstborn, mm-hmm. and you have a secondborn, and you have a thirdborn. And anybody who's either a firstborn or a lastborn, like they know that there's a difference. Mm-hmm. They know this. So there is a hierarchy. There is a structure with which these kinds of things work. And so it is really important then for us to be aware that in any social structure that we are part of, we are playing either the role of a mom. If you're a woman, you're a mom, you're a sister, you're a daughter. That's Mm -hmm. what you are. Mm -hmm. And if you're a sister, that means you're working, you're a peer, but you're a peer with like, am I working with a twin? Am I working with an older brother or sister? Am I working with a younger brother? Like I'm going to play my role. And I I would add wife too. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The whole thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So why is this important? Because when it comes to the church, as we say, like we always take our families to work. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm the pastor of a church, I'm the dad. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm a woman, I like I'm the mom yeah. here in the church. Yeah. And right? we even which means we even use those terminology sometimes where it's like, yeah, she's sort of like the mom for the whole company or yeah, that's my work husband or yeah, so we do use these terminologies right. to describe it. Right. And what's important about that is that churches tend to reflect the leaders in churches tend to reflect the degree to which they have or have not taken care of unfinished business in their own families of origin. Mm, mm-hmm. So why is this important? It's important to say that, oh, well, like what was shame like in my family? So it's not just what does the church do, but it's also me who comes into the church. I'm also going to respond to some of these things mm-hmm. because I know that in your ministry, you will have people who you long to be helpful for and you offer help. And for some reason, like it's, they have a hard time receiving it. Mm -hmm. Look, the rich young ruler, 
Jesus looked at him and loved him in Mark's gospel, and he couldn't tolerate it. Mm. He misses the look. He can't do the work. He's not able, like, heaven was not going to work for him. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because it was going to be too difficult for him to give up his role as working really hard to prove to you that I'm good enough for you to love me. Mm. That's what his money represents. His money in and of itself is not a problem. His money represents his shame that I'm not enough, which is why I got to work as hard. I got to work. Right. But if you tell me that that's not what I'm supposed to do, then like what happens when you discover who I really am? And like, I'm, I'm put out to pasture because my shame is at work in this regard. And so in churches, We can do this by virtue, first of all, of not being aware of our own unfinished business with shame. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we become anxious. I mean, we're not aware that this is what we're doing. We become anxious. And so we are much more about talking about things, talking about people than talking with people, being with our parishioners. And so pastors have a hard time developing a proper way of being vulnerable. Like one of the first antidotes to shame is vulnerability. And one of the first ways that pastors can diffuse and protect against shame being unleashed in their congregation is by being a role model of vulnerability. Now, I don't mean that pastors should be telling all their secrets from the pulpit, but there are, I I know of a handful of people, a handful of pastors who do this really beautifully. They are revealing as part of the work that they're doing from the pulpit and their leadership, they reveal the truth about their own life. Mm Mm-hmm. That yeah. lets other people know that shame is not a thing that we have to be afraid of. Mm-hmm. But if we're not doing that kind of work in our own personal lives, then what we tend to do is we like to say, look, the act of shame is the act of condemnation. And it comes out sideways in all kinds of subtle ways in terms of how controlling we are in our churches, the tenor and posture we have in the sermons that we preach and the education that we preach, you know, primarily paying attention to behavioral modification rather than paying attention to being curious about where people are really wounded Mm -hmm. in trouble. Mm -hmm. Again, this is not to say that the church doesn't make demands, Mm -hmm. right? Jesus, love puts demands on us. Love puts demands around sexual ethics. Love puts demands around justice. Love puts demands around lots of things. But my capacity to live into those demands is going to be pretty tough if I'm getting a more explicit message coming from some place in from mom and dad, essentially, or from my older brothers and sisters, if I'm getting some message that is continually condemning in nature. And, and, and that happens. We say, look, condemnation is a thing when I'm critical of others, when I'm dispensing shame, what I'm doing is actually giving to other people out of the excess of my own life. Mm-hmm. I shame people because I have an overflow of it in my own story. Wow, that's convicting. <laughs> yeah. And so we always know that any time, like, and you know, I mean, I have my own stories of where I've been more than happy to like uh, share shame with other people, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But I, it's always been the case that when I do that, it's coming from a place of shame in my own story mm-hmm. in that in that very moment mm-hmm. that I can't tolerate. I'm not doing my own work in that moment. Instead, I'm going to share it with somebody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's convicting to those of us who are parents, like how many times we've shamed our children because oh. we can't face our own. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah. I, uh, and I so appreciate your work because it's mm. bringing us to the places Thanks. that we need to go. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I hope and trust that that's the case. And yeah. I'm glad to be helpful where I can be. So where is shame showing up in your life? How does it cause you to withdraw? How does it cloud your thinking or close you off from people when you really need to be open and engaging? Well, I love that Kurt talked about shame as something that is actually a signal to us. It's not something that's always good or bad. When you experience shame, rather than dismissing or avoiding it, what would it look like for you to ask questions about what it might be trying to tell you and acknowledge it as perhaps a prompt to draw you near to God? I'm definitely going to recommend that you check out Kurt's book, The Soul of Shame. So if you'd like to connect with him or get a copy of that, we've included the links in our show notes. Well, that's it for this week's conversation. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if so, please consider leaving a review in your podcast app so that others can find what we're doing here at Job with Julie. I'll be back next week and you'll hear my conversation with Sam Ferguson. And we'll talk about a more pastoral approach to gender dysphoria. So have a great week and I'll see you next time for more Java with Julie.